when Leo the Third died in 741, he left three immediate legacies which would have an impact on the Byzantine world. One is that he had founded the legitimacy of the Asarian dynasty, and the people accepted that members of this house should rule the empire. The second thing is that he had left the empire in the hands of his young son, Constantine V, who was around 21 or so at the time. And the third fact is that he had inaugurated an era of iconoclastic policies whereby the Byzantine state was engaged in destroying and confiscating icons and preventing their use in worship. Now, this last fact, the institution of iconoclasm, was something that was not universally popular, and in fact, there was a pretty strong resistance to it in the capital itself, and possibly also in the Balkans, and definitely in Italy. Well, um, another factor is that because Constantine was still getting his feet under him, uh, and he had this unpopular policy to perpetuate, there was a bit of a vulnerability. Not from an outsider, as I said, uh, the Asarian dynasty was fairly well entrenched by this point due to Leo III's successes. However, if someone, say, had family ties and a power base, they could still um, exploit anti-iconoclastic uh, sentiment and make a run at the throne. And it turns out there was such a person, and his name was Artabasdus. His attempt at usurpation from 742 to 743 dominates the early years of Constantine V's reign, and I think that it's only fitting that we talk about Artabasdus before we move on and talk about Constantine V, since basically if we were to talk about Constantine V, his first actions deal with this very crisis caused by Artabasdus. So without any further ado, let's just talk about Artabasdus, and uh, that will provide the perfect segue into Constantine V, which, yes, will be coming up soon. So who was Artabasdus and where did he come from? Well, it's pretty clear from his name that he was of Armenian descent. Most likely his ancestors had been refugees from Armenia who had then settled in Roman territory, and his family was probably relatively well off just based on the fact that Artabasdus was able to gain a governorship. So they might have been a noble family in Armenia, which then fled and was able to retain its rank and wealth in Byzantine lands. We don't actually know how old Artabasdus was, so for the purpose of this video, I'm going to assume that he was a near contemporary of Leo III, since they were both governors and Artabasdus was still alive and kicking, and also active when Leo III died. So I'm going to guess that he was around 55 to 60 years old when Leo kicked the bucket in 741, but again, that is just a guess. I don't actually know. In 713, Anastasius II appointed Artabasdus to be the new Stratagos of the Armeniacan theme, and this is actually the first known fact about Artabasdus' life. Um, his thematic capital was at the city of Amasia. At some point during his four-year tenure as Stratagos, he made an agreement with the future emperor Leo III to overthrow Theodosius III, and um, that is really his main claim to fame, is you know combining the forces of the two most powerful themes to overthrow the sitting emperor. Part of the agreement between Leo and Artabasdus is that Artabasdus was to become Leo's son-in-law and serve as a senior official in his government. So Artabasdus married Leo's daughter Anna, and he took up the position of Curo Palates, which means the master of the palace. This is a very high-ranking position within the Byzantine administration. And in addition to that office, he retained control of the Armeniacan theme um, by having his son Nikitas as Stratagos there. Um, so it was retained by his portion of the family, effectively. And he also controlled the Opsikion theme, which was just on the other side of the straits from Constantinople. Um, and uh, in terms of uh, supporting coups and all that kind of stuff, Opsikiakin theme was actually the most well-positioned of all of the themes, pretty much. It looks like his eldest son, Nikitas, was by a previous wife, but he has a son named Nikiphorus, who was younger and seems to have been Anna's son. So um, by the time that Leo died... Uh, Artabasdus has put himself in a very strong position. He has support within the capital, and he has one of his sons in control of one of the two strongest themes in the empire. 
So it should come as no surprise that Artabasdus was able to mount this attempt at seizing the throne. In June of 741, Leo III died, and he was succeeded by his son Constantine V, who was 21 or 22 years old. This means that Constantine V was not particularly vulnerable, and he had also been associated on the throne with his father for some years, and presumably had a pretty decent amount of experience when compared with a whole lot of new emperors. In summer of 742, Constantine V apparently thought that his position at home was secure, and he saw a crisis in the east, so he decided to lead an army there to fight the Arabs. So it looks like Constantine was completely unaware of Artabasdus' intentions, and that Artabasdus had managed to plan in secret without the emperor hearing about it. Um, the problem that Constantine inherited is that Leo had really left the empire divided over the issue of icons, um, and there were people willing to back a candidate who would uh, support the restoration of these icons. So Artabasdus understood that, and he decided to use his family ties, position of power, and the support of the Icona duels in the capital to seize the moment and um, you know, make himself emperor and then pass the throne along in his new branch of the Asarian dynasty. So let's look at how this um, coup goes. Most coups are relatively private affairs, or they capitalize on unpopularity and gain overwhelming support before moving forward. But Artabasdus seems to have triggered his coup a little bit early, possibly prematurely. So Artabasdus revolted while Constantine V was in the field and marching towards the frontier in June of 742. It looks like Artabasdus raised the force and went out to meet the emperor in open battle. It's possible that Artabasdus had been plotting and then he got discovered, so then he decided to just risk it all in a battle. It's also possible that Constantine had ordered him to raise a force and join his army for the eastern campaign, and then Artabasdus uh, had revealed his intentions by attacking. It's not really clear exactly what the circumstances were, but this is a fairly unusual way to begin a coup. At any rate, um, the two forces met, and Artabasdus was able to hand the young emperor a defeat, and then, rather than following up and defeating Constantine once and for all, Artabasdus instead opted to march on to Constantinople, where he crowned himself emperor and also gave the same honor to his second son, Nicephorus. For Constantine V, uh, he didn't have the manpower to retake the capital, so he decided to build up his strength, so he retreated to Amorium, which was the old thematic capital of Anatolicon, a place where his father had built up his strength before taking the throne. And here, he presumably had a friendly reception. It looks like most of the people in this area were iconoclast, and most of the soldiers here um, still had some, um, at least institutional memory of Leo III, so they were happy to take up the cause of his son. Uh, this is an artist rendition of what Amorium would have looked like a little after this period, around the year 800 or so. It would have been a fairly typical Byzantine provincial city. Following their battle in the summer of 742, um, both imperial contenders decided to spend the fall and winter preparing their forces for a decisive battle. So Artabasis in Constantinople was raising troops while Constantine V was doing the same thing in Amorium. At the same time, Artabasis also restored the icons in Constantinople. And this really seems to have rallied the support of the Icona dual majority behind him in the capital. It also earned him the support of Pope Zacharias in Rome. Um, it looks like a lot of icons had not been destroyed and that Leo III's ban on icons had not been very effective. Um, so a lot of things that had been reported destroyed ended up being pulled out of storage and displayed. And later on, when Constantine V really intensifies the anti-icon persecution, it's probably because he knew that without harsh measures, there would be no real or lasting results. So, in some ways, you could make the case that Artabasdus's usurpation is probably what really made iconoclasm take a hard turn um, and become more about persecuting people than about destroying images. In the spring of 743, having arranged things at home, Artabasdus led his army out of Constantinople in person 
and he entered into Asia Minor seeking a decisive battle with Constantine. It's pretty clear from the context that Artabazus' hope was that he would hunt down Constantine and eliminate his only real rival, the power. Um, with Constantine gone, he was the next best representative of the Asarian dynasty, or at least his son Nikephorus was, and there wouldn't really be another strong contender to his power. So, Artabazus was hoping for a decisive battle, and eventually Constantine offered him battle near the ruins of Sardis in Asia Minor in May of 743. This battle was a clear victory for Constantine, but it was not a decisive victory. Um, Artabazus seems to have been discouraged, however, and he withdrew to the capital and left the war in the hands of his eldest son, Nikitas, um, who had to spend a reasonable amount of time reorganizing before he was able to challenge Constantine once again. So uh, Artabazus had lost the battle, but the war was still far from over. So let's look at the remainder of the war. Later on in the summer, Constantine and Nikitas fought a battle at Modrine, and this was another victory for Constantine. However, despite the fact that he had carried the field, he still left Nikitas' army intact once again, and Nikitas was ultimately able to rally his men and threaten Constantine's line of march and prevent his easy passage into Europe. So this would necessitate yet another battle between the two forces. So at Nicomedia, the two commanders met in battle once again, but this time Nikitas was captured and this put an end to his army. Um, and after this victory, Constantine V was able to cross over into Europe and initiate a siege of Constantinople. So the end was nigh for Artabazdus and his brief reign. The siege of Constantinople didn't last for long. On November 2nd, 743, the Byzantine capital fell and Constantine V re-entered the city victorious. Artabazdus and his sons Nikitas and Nikephorus were all blinded and forced to enter a monastery. We don't know exactly when they died, but we do know that based on the way that blinding was practiced, um, if the blinding procedure was brutal, then people often would die of infection soon after. Um, and it's not really clear how rough the procedure was. So it's possible that these guys lived for several more years. It's also possible that they all died within weeks of the procedure. Um, due to infection or other complications. When we speak of failed usurpers, there usually isn't all that much to say when it comes to talking about their long-term legacy and impact. However, in the case of Artabazdus, there's a fair amount that we can say. He's an indispensable figure in the establishment of the Asarian dynasty. After all, without his aid, it's unlikely that Leo III would have been able to overthrow Theodosius III, and it's even more unlikely that he would have been able to maintain a stable dynasty and reestablish order after 20 or so years of almost nonstop chaos. It also, with Artabazdus, we can see in the events of his life and his attempted usurpation that religious positions could be and were exploited for political gain by imperial contenders. So it's not just a matter of someone could do something. We have an example of this happening in action thanks to Artabazdus. Um, and we could also go a step further and say that possibly the reason why something like iconoclasm was implemented and later ended is simply due to the balance of military force on one side as opposed to the other. Um, the fact that the population seems to have been very receptive to his usurpation Hence, that iconoclast may have either been a minority in the empire or else a regional phenomenon as many old-school scholars like to talk about when they said that um, icons were a part of worship in the West, but people in the East who were influenced by Jewish and Muslim traditions tended to not favor icons. So it's actually sort of a, probably one of the cornerstones of the older uh, generation of scholars' interpretation of iconoclasm. Um, Artabazus' betrayal may also have really played a role in making Constantine V who he was later. So we see his generalship first blossoming during this time. He loses his initial battle, but then he wins three in a row to reclaim power. And he also has a speedy siege of Constantinople. And also it's possible that due to the um, fervor with which the restoration of the icons was greeted, that Constantine V 
was uh, convinced that he needed to take a firmer stance on icons than his father had, and that that firmer stance needed to involve the persecution of people and not just the destruction of images. So it's possible that indirectly Artabasdus more or less made Constantine V a man, if you will. Like he was uh, his um, impetus to become the Constantine V that we know of in history rather than just another ruler named Constantine. So anyway, those are my thoughts on Artabasdus. I'll be coming back soon with another video about Constantine V, so stay tuned. Until then, I'm Thersites the Historian.